Yeah, so, hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Nick. I want to welcome those watching online with us. Uh, I, I want to start today by talking about a travesty that happened in my household, and my fear is it may have happened in some of your households, and we need to talk about it. It happened about a week ago. I was afraid it was going to happen. Uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, she came over, and she is incredibly sinful, like her mother. And so <laughs> I looked at her, and I said, hey, I've got I've to go. Um, don't, don't, don't do this. And she's like, dad, I love you. I know, no way. And I was gone for 15 minutes. That's it. I went to the store really quickly. I thought I was safe. It was going to be okay. And I came back to just the most, just horrific scene. It was a travesty. I walked back into my house and there were Christmas decorations everywhere. Some of you are sinful. We'll give you a chance to repent, get baptized today. It'll be okay. Um, Mariah Carey was singing, all I want for Christmas is you. And I thought, but I don't want you. Like, I want you out of the house. Like, move. Like, uh, it was bad. And, and I got to tell you, if you are one of those people that decorates early, um, stop it. That's all I'm going to say. There's a Boo. <laughs> You sound like an Alabama fan. So anyway, uh, <laughs> they're sinful too. Okay, so no, uh, the reason why it's a problem, and, and this really fits why I want to talk about today, is there is a temptation in all of us, whether it's Christmas, whether it's something serious, to take something that is really, really good, and I absolutely love Christmas. Christmas is my favorite time of the year. It just has a specific time. The temptation for us is to make it bigger. That if, if Christmas Day is good, you know it'd be better? Christmas Eve. And if we open on Christmas presents on Christmas Day, then can we open one on Christmas Eve? Any parent get tricked with that one? It's like, it's just one. If Christmas Eve is great, what if we, what if we had a Christmas week? What if we had a Christmas month? What if we had a whole Christmas season? What if we celebrated Christmas before Thanksgiving? And that's the line. We want to make it bigger because we think at the end of the day, in all things, bigger means better, right? If, if it was just bigger. In fact, here's the deal, and here's where I want to go, that I don't think bigger is always better. In fact, I've got a few pictures to show you to kind of prove this really quickly. Bigger is not always better. Let me show you this first one's right here. It's a cell phone. How many of you had a phone like that? Just really quickly. How many of you, you're like, no, this is great. Like, you're just kind of like clunky, you know, like, doot, doot, doot. Some of you, you're younger, you're like, what the heck is that? So anyway, that was cutting edge technology 20 years ago. Bigger is not always better. Sometimes when it comes to looks, ladies, sometimes, you know, we kind of do that. L listen, here we go. Uh, bigger is not always better. <laughs> Some of you, when I said ladies, you were like, where is he going with that? But anyway, so, no, bigger isn't always better. Men have the same problem, though. Men struggle with this kind of tension. Like, man, I just want bigger muscles. If my muscles were bigger and then you end up like this, that's not good. No, that's not good. I've got the last one is for all the ladies, and I hope you agree with me that bigger is not always better. When it comes to the size of the child that you birth, it's not always better, right? Oh, I don't care what you say, that hurt, okay? That was painful. That is a 13 and a half pound baby right there. That is painful. Bigger isn't always better, and, and you kind of know that, but here's the tension I want to wrestle with, and, and I think you wrestle with, I know I wrestle with it is, but we believe that, that in a serious way, there's some of you in here today, and not all of you, but you think, man, if I had a bigger checking account, my life would be better, that what's holding me back is if I just had a few thousand dollars more, but you know, come on, let's be honest, that bigger isn't always better, that if you, God gave you $10,000 today and gave you a bigger checking account, but not better spending habits, you'd be gone in six months. Bigger isn't the solution. Some of you, you want a bigger family. And what I mean by that is you're single. Maybe, maybe you're in high school or college and you're thinking, man, I just, if I had a bigger family, if I just had one person, it'd be, it'd be better, that'd be, that'd be awesome. But, but as we're going to unpack a little bit more today, you, you don't have a great relationship with yourself. And so how do you expect to have a great relationship with somebody else? Bigger isn't always better. For some, it's influence. It's not even something physical. It's, it's, it's internal. It's like, man, I'd love to have more influence in my kid's life or in my spouse's life. I'd, I'd love for them to listen to me a little bit more. Maybe it's a parent or a friend. It's like you kind of see what they need to do, and, and you're praying, God, give me bigger influence, but 
Where we're going to go today and for the rest of the series that I hope you get is I think we flipped the script and we need to go back to how God originally intended it. That bigger doesn't make your life better. That's the wrong order. That where we're going to go today in the next several weeks is this principle right here that better, better comes before bigger. That what you need is better spending habits What you need is a better understanding of who you are so you can better relate to other people and influence them more. What you need is a better relationship with your heavenly father. What you need is a better understanding of who you are and what you're called to do. What we need is better. And when you have better, bigger comes along. And and so for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about how do we flip the script? Because I believe God wants to give you bigger. I think he talks about this. God wants to give you an abundant life. In fact, he says it this way a little bit. He says, listen, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. And that that is what God's desire. But the problem is this. We pray for bigger, but we don't pursue better. And so we stay stuck in this mindset of, man, I wish I had this, but I will not work for what I wish for. And so for the next several weeks, what I want to do, I want to talk about how do you have better because I believe whatever it is that you want, bigger is on the other side of better. And for us as a church, the same thing is true. See, this season that we we do this every single year is what we call our year-end offering season. And we're not going to talk about money, okay? So you can, don't worry about that. But but what we do is we understand, and I believe this on my heart, that eventually God's going to call us to have a bigger place, that we want a bigger influence in the community. We want more people to come, and, and not because we're about numbers, but because, and I heard this years ago, because every single number is a name, and every name matters to God, because every name will spend eternity somewhere. And at one point in time in this church, you were just a number, You just showed up as a guest. And and my prayer is that God used this church to influence you, to impact you. And all we're saying when we talk about as a church, we want a bigger influence. We want a bigger place. All I'm saying is we want to grow God's kingdom in a bigger, bigger way. But to do that, I I realize this. Our church, our campus, our communities, we're going to have to get better first. So we're going to walk through that. And today, I want to look at a story. It's in, from the book of Matthew. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they're wrestling with this tension. They're wrestling with this tension of bigger and all of these issues. And so Jesus tends to use parables, which are stories, to illustrate principles. And so he's going to tell us a story. We're going to unpack it really quickly. But, but he starts off like this, Matthew 25. And he says, again, meaning he's in the middle of these parables, it will be like a man going on a journey who, is call, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So the, the context is this. There's a man. He's got some money. Matter of fact, we're going to learn he has a lot of money. He has a ridiculous amount of money. And we know that because of the next verse. It says this. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. And so the context is this. There's a couple things I want you to see. One is, in the parables of Jesus, God is always one of the, one of the people. Like, you got to figure that out. And so, in this story, God is represented as the rich person who is entrusting the money. He, he, is the one, he is the wealthy person who is entrusting, and then there's the servants. And you are the servants. And we're going to see something, because there's two ways to react to this situation. And it should be obvious how we should, but again, it's easy for us to flip the script. It's easier for us to think bigger is more important than better. Because when it says five bags of gold, I don't know what you think of, but let me tell you what this text actually says. In the Greek, it uses this word, and some of your translations will say talent. It won't say bags of gold. It'll say talent. And, and a talent is 20 years worth of your work. I did the math really quickly. In Kentucky, minimum wage is seven twenty-five. dollars So if you, the minimum that this would represent, I took seven twenty-five, dollars multiplied it by 40, multiplied it by 52, and then 20. And do you know what you get? Over $300,000. The point is this, that even the person with the one bag, that's a big gift, right? That's a generous gift. I mean, even the person who got the least is generous. That, that the person who's doling out the gifts, it would be easy, and that's what we kind of do sometimes, Right? It would be easy to go, well, that's not fair. Are you kidding? Like, he gave five to one and, and 
two or three to another and one to one. I mean, that, that's not fair. And what happens is we tend to miss what we have because of what God has given other people. We tend to miss all the gifts or the talents that God has given us in this room. There are people that are gifted and talented in so many different ways. Some of you, God has gifted you financially. You, you have been, you've been given five bags of gold, which represents about $1.5 million. You are gifted financially, but you have one bag relationally. Some of you, you are relationally full. God has blessed you with an incredible marriage or kids or friends or community or whatever, and you are relationally full, and yet, maybe financially, you've got one bag. You're trying to figure it out. Maybe when you think through how you're gifted and wired, you have some skill sets that other people do not have, and yet while you see those, you can't see what you have because you're still struggling with what others have. My point is this. Life is not fair. God gives out to their abilities and their strengths because better comes before bigger. We want more, but God says, no, no, I'm going to give it to your ability. If you develop better habits, as we're going to see here in a second, I will give you more of what you currently want. So the story goes on. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. I don't know if you know much about financial investments, but that's a pretty good return. Well, it's like, oh, you, you just doubled the money. That's great. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. And so you have the first two servants, they take, don't miss this, the immediacy of it, they went to work. They understood that there's an urgency with what God has given them or what the servant in that, or the master had given them in that moment. I would say, and we don't have time for this. We're going to unpack this later. Um, I don't think enough Christians understand the urgency with the gifting, with the talents, financially, relationally, spiritually, emotionally. They do not understand the urgency with what God has entrusted them with. The first two, they, they understand the legacy of multiplication. They understand that when you invest in this kingdom, when you invest it in the right way, it always comes back. And so it goes on, though. It says, but the man who had received one bag went off, I love this, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Don't miss this. He probably worked harder than the first ones. He worked harder to hide because of what we're going to see here in a few moments. And I think in the church, what happens is we tend to dig holes ourselves and hide our talents, our gifts, our strengths. We hide behind our excuses of, Nick, you know what, I, I cannot give financially. Do you know What's going on in the world today? Do you know who was elected president this past week? Do you know what's happening? Do you know my debt? I just, you hide. You work really hard of thinking of the excuses and making these situations and arguing with God of why you can't financially support. You hide. You hide behind maybe God wants you to start to serve and, and, and do something. You hide behind. Do you understand how busy my schedule is and what I've got going on and what's happening? And I don't know if I can commit to this and da da da. We hide. You hide behind why you can't forgive that person or why you can't send them a message of encouragement. We hide behind all the things that God wants us to do sometimes. And, and, and what we find is it actually takes more work to hide what God has given us than it does to actually just invest it. But Jesus says it this way. He says, I've come to, to, to make your life easy. My yoke is light. That, that a lot of our stress and chaos and pain and frustration is not because God's standards are too high and he wants too much of us. It's actually because we hold on to too much, are not willing to let go of what we want and step into what he has for us. And so it requires a lot of work. He hides his master's money. And so, sure enough, it's a very predictable end. I mean, this is not a shocking story. There's no twist ending. It, it goes on, it says this. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Just side note, just, we're not going to talk about this today, but at some point, you will settle accounts with God. It's why we do this. And, so, and again, we don't talk about this a lot. I did a whole series on heaven and hell, but I just, I, need, I feel like I need to say this. At some point, all of us, we will stand before God and we will settle the accounts. He will ask us, what have you done with what I have given you? And I did not give you more than you could handle. I gave to you based on your ability what did you do with it? And you will settle accounts. And there will be a moment where you have to justify. You will explain. You will walk through. Here's kind of what I did. And, and, and this next part is kind of this moment, this kind of illustration, this story, this parable that illustrates kind of what happens when that goes down. It goes on. It says, the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. I uh, 
doubled it. Sure enough, it's not a trick question. It says, this master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been, and don't miss this word, faithful. He doesn't say, you are so smart. You are so gifted. You are so amazing. Man, your ability to discern and be shrewd with the stock market. He said, no, I gave based on your abilities. And what I'm looking for is not the smartest, not the most talented. I'm looking for the faithful ones who will be faithful to honor me with what I have given them. He says, you've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. I find this so fascinating because here's the deal. God, in this story, God is representative of the manager, looks at him and says, I've given you a few things. I already told you, minimum, that's like $1.5 million. See, in God's economy of abundance, whether it's finances, relationship, whether it's the fruit of the spirit, like peace, joy, love, kindness, patience, whatever it is, we cannot fathom the richness, the fullness of what he wants to give us. And again, let me be very, very clear. This is not a prosperity gospel message where, man, if you just give $10, God's gonna bless you. No, here's a weird promise. If you start to give financially, it probably will go poorly for you financially. It's a weird promise, but I've seen it over and over again. Nick, I started giving. What happened? Did God bless you? Yeah, with like a broken water heater and my tires went bald and like, like this is not you trying to manipulate God. Be very clear with that. This is you understanding that God wants to bless you in more ways than this world has to offer. But what it costs is you willing to offer this world. And many times we hold on to this. We hold on to our our small little amounts that God's entrusted us going, oh, I can't give it up. And God's up there going, if you could only see what I have. He says, come and share in your master's happiness. Next slide. The man with two bags of gold came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. It's the same story. And he's going to have the same answer. His master replied, well done, good. And here's our word, faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I I want you to see that, that the master is not upset because one had 10 and one had four. No, what he's looking for is the faithfulness. The amount is not the issue. The heart is. When it comes to generosity, when it comes to serving, when it comes to forgiving, when it comes to doing and being faithful in whatever God's called you to do, and we're going to unpack these in some critical areas. When it comes to your faithfulness, it's not about comparison and going, well, they have more or they have less. Or I could. It's No, it's you being willing to be faithful with what God's given you. The standard with which God will hold you to is against you. And that's it. It's not a comparison game. But too often we get caught up in that. And we're like, okay, yeah, I know, I, I, I know I'm not perfect, but I, I do more than they do. It's like that's the wrong standard. And then there's the third one. And it says this. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Is that anywhere in the text? If anything, the master was incredibly generous. We started that. If anything, the master comes out and goes, man, I have all this money, and man, I got some people in front of me, and and I really care about them and like them. Listen, here, go. I'm going to give you this, and we're going to talk about it later, but man, like, let's go and be you. I'm going to bless you, but he couldn't do what he was supposed to do because he saw the master in the wrong light. We're going to come back to that in a moment. It's so important, but again, don't miss the fact that the servant, the servant sees the master in the wrong light. And it goes on. It says, so I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And the master's response is so telling. He says, You wicked, lazy servant. I already told you, he probably worked harder than the other two. He had to dig a big hole. I mean, we're talking like at least $300,000 in gold, and they didn't have checking accounts. They're like, can you kind of hide it? Like, no, no, no. Dig a big hole, bury it, go back out, dig it up again. I mean, it was a lot of work. Why is he lazy? Because he didn't do what he was supposed to do. Sometimes we work harder doing what God doesn't want us to do than what he calls us to do. So, So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Next slide. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. He says, actually, you had a moment. 
You had a moment and you blew it. I think in the next several weeks, my prayer is that you're going to have a moment with God. You're going to, moment, you're going to have a moment where God's going to speak to you about something he wants you to do, about something he wants you to give, about, about something he wants you to let go, or maybe somebody he wants you to forgive, or maybe, maybe somebody he wants you to start a relationship with. I don't know what it is. What I know is there will be a moment, and what you do with it matters. Because at the end of this, it wraps up with this. It says, so take the bag of gold from him and give to the one who has 10 bags. And then the last verse we're going to look at, it says, for whoever has will be given more, bigger. When you're faithful with a little, you'll be entrusted with more. When you get better with what you've been given, it will get bigger. It's better before bigger. And they will have, and I love this word, an abundance. You're wanting something more. And my hope and prayers over the next several weeks, you will start to understand that first comes better, though. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken away from them. You will be tempted to hold on to what you have and not be faithful with what God has trusted you. And I've seen it over and over and over again. You'll be tempted to walk away from a relationship, maybe do something different with it, and you will want to hold on to it and go, I can't do that, God. If I do that, I'll lose a relationship. And I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over again. But if you're not faithful, it'll be gone either way. you would be tempted to hold on to your finances. I see it all the time. And then it just disappear. you would be tempted to hold on to your anger and your frustration and your bitterness towards your spouse or your kids or your friend or some enemy. And God's going to ask you to forgive them and let go of that to, to, to walk in your abilities and strengths. And, and if you don't, I'm telling you, It'll get worse for you because we want bigger, but I'm telling you, better comes before bigger. Now, that said, I've got a few minutes left. What I want to do is I want to I give you the key to this because I think while every single person in here, you have some different version of bigger, it's going to be different for everybody. It could be relationally, financially, experientially. It could be influence. It could be a role or a title. It could be a job thing. I mean, it's numerous things that we could have. While everybody's bigger is different, I think the steps to get there are all the same. In fact, I think that there are four relationships that you have. Every one of us has these, that how you handle them, if you can get them better, that's when you'll be able to step into bigger. But if you skip these, well, you'll have the wishing, but you won't have the work, and you'll never step into it. And so, remaining time, I want to give you four kind of relationships that we all have that I think are called to be better. Number one is this. It's our relationship with God. See, how you view God will determine with what you do with what God's given you. One person said, man, he's generous, he's good, he's great, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leverage it for this guy's kingdom. I'm going to make sure that there's a return on investment. I'm going to build this guy's portfolio. Why? Because he's blessed me and trusted me with this. I'm going to leverage it. And, and because God's good, I can trust him. What they understand is God is looking for progress, not perfection. But there is a different way to view God. Like the third guy. He's mean. He's angry. He's, he's just frustrated. And that guy is looking for perfection, not progress. And so what happens is there's this fear of, I don't want to mess it up. There's this struggle of like, yeah, okay, Nick, I, know, I feel like I'm supposed to do that, but like, ugh. but if I do that, what if I don't do it well? What if it doesn't end well? What if I make a mistake? What if, what if I don't step into that the right way or whatever that is? We say stuck. And, and some of you, you're stuck in your relationship with God. I'm telling you, you'll never step into bigger. You'll never step into the abundant life that God has for you until you see God as loving you as loving the world, as being good. We're going to unpack that next week. We're going to spend a whole week talking about what does it look like to develop better habits, better relationship with God, because that influences everything. But the second one is close to it. See, the second one is this. It's a relationship with yourself. And, and, and let me just be very, very clear. You might want to skip to this one, but if you don't have a good relationship with God, you'll never have a good relationship with yourself because you will see yourself in light of everyone else, not in your creator. And you will say stuck and frustrated, working for the opinions of other people, trying to validate your existence instead of looking to the one who actually created you, who put his stamp of approval on you through his son, Jesus Christ. You will stay frustrated. And so, so in a few weeks, I, I just, I love this statement. I want you to see it. I say it all the time. 
is so huge. It's this right here, that I believe, no matter who you are, that you are made on purpose, with purpose, for a purpose. That, that is, if you get anything out of today, I, I hope you get that, that, that you are here. Let me unpack this really quickly for you. You are made on purpose, which means you are intentional. Your parents may have looked at you one day and said, you are an accident. I've told all five of my children that. I was like, I didn't necessarily want you. Uh, so they're going to need therapy. So anyway, um, but, but here's the deal. God did. That you, you are not an accident in God's eyes. That you were made on purpose. That God created you and said, no, I want you here. I want you in America in 2024. I want you to understand what's going on. I'm going to give you the brain. I'm going to put you in this place. And the fact that you're in this church or watching online right now is not an accident. You are not an accident. You were made on purpose. You have value. It was intentional. Which leads to the second one. With purpose, meaning this is so huge. You are gifted in such a unique way. Again, don't miss the story. The master looked and went, you get five talents, you get two talents, you get one talent. And God does the same thing. When he made you, he said, listen, man, I'm going to gift some of you, and you're going to be able to sing like, so, like Chris can just sing. Do you know why I've never led worship? I can't sing. That was too quick. Just <laughs> chill, all right? That was very too quick. No, I can't sing. I have different gifts. Some of you, God's blessed you financially. Some of you, God's blessed you with no finances, but you have different things. The point is this. Don't compare. God made you on purpose, and then he gifted you uniquely. And, and that is so important. Why? Because he made you for a purpose, meaning God has called you right here in 2024, leading to 2025, to do something incredible. In fact, my hope and prayer is over the next several weeks, it will be incredibly clear what God's called you, specifically you, only you, to do. But if you don't understand this, you'll get distracted. See, talents are a weird thing. Gifts are a weird thing. For years, I struggled with what I was not. There's a lot of things I'm not gifted at. Matter of fact, I joke all the time. I have like two things I'm pretty good at, and that's, that's about it. I'm not gifted in a lot of things. And, and, and I used to really struggle with that until I realized that, you know what? My, my strengths are what should guide me. But my weaknesses well, that's, that's what should guard me. And, and, and the very things that used to frustrate me that I'm not good at actually are guardrails to keep me focused on what I'm called to do. I never, ever, I used to, I never, ever sit and daydream about what it would look like to wor lead worship. I never think through, man, I bet I could do it. Like, it's just not even on the radar. You know what I think about? Man, how do I get to be a better preacher? How do I get to be a better speaker? What, how do I get to be a better leader? How can I be a better pastor? Why? Because those are the things God's called me to do. Your gifts are guidelines. Your weaknesses are guardrails. And if you don't understand the relationship that you have with yourself, you will struggle with the third one, which is your relationship with others. It's, it's, it's a big one. And, and, and the bottom line is this. You cannot, I'm, I'm going to go on record and say, you cannot have a healthy, good relationship with other people if you do not have a healthy relationship with yourself. That's why some of you struggle in your marriages. Because you're looking for your spouse to fulfill the, the need that you have for yourself. And that God has for you. You're looking for your friends to validate you when all you need is God and all you need is a clear identity. You cannot have those healthy relationships where you just get to be you in front of them, with them, with your kids, with your spouse, without overfunctioning. Why? Because you have this need that only God can fill through who you are and how He created you, but you're looking for somebody else. So conflict happens, frustration happens. We say weird things like, you make me so angry. Let me just be very clear. No one makes you anything. You know how I know that? And you've done this too. There are days where people around me that I'm really, really close to have been just the devil. And I'm like, okay. I don't like it, but I can handle it. I'm having a good day. I can handle it. And there are other days, and people can do the dumbest, smallest things. And it's like, you die today. Like, that's it. Like, we're done. Like, I'm like, you know, listen, it's not what happens to you. It's me. It's my relationship with myself. No one makes me mad. No one makes me frustrated. 
I do with my expectations and my identity and my understanding of who I am. And you will never develop healthy relationships with other people unless you have a healthy relationship with yourself, which is the last one. It's going to be the most challenging one. It's your relationship with stuff. Woo! Some of you are like, I don't think I have a relationship with stuff. Here's a quick test. If you get excited when Amazon delivery shows up, <laughs> if you're like, oh, even worse, if you're like, I don't know what I ordered. <laughs> Some of you are like, wait a minute. <laughs> You might have a relationship with stuff. We live in a culture we have a relationship with stuff. It's one of the reasons why we do the year-end offering. Here, here's my heart. Uh, God doesn't need your money. Let me be very clear. River Lake Church doesn't need your money. And we're going to talk about what we're going to spend the money on that's given in a few uh, next week, I think. And it's going to be incredible. We're going to make this place better. We're going to improve this facility and make it better for you and families and so many different things. But, but at the end of the day, we don't, we don't need the money. What? What we're looking for is giving you an outlet to say, no, 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 God, I trust you. God, I want to be generous to you. I want to be like the first two servants and leverage what you have given me for your kingdom because I don't want to function outside of my identity and outside of who you've called me to be in relationship to other people. See, here's the deal. If you don't have a healthy relationship with other people, stuff will become your God and you will never sacrifice your stuff for others. Because your stuff is God. In fact, we say it like this. Our core value number one is we will sacrifice the things we love. Why? For those we love. And the only way that that first core value happens is when we have a healthy relationship with others. And the only way that happens is when you have a healthy relationship with yourself. And the only way that happens is when you have a healthy relationship with God. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to walk through this. But before that, I want to give you a very clear step. If you're new with us, and I'm glad you are, every year we do this, and every year I write a devotional, and we've written the better devotional. It's a four-week study, and if you guessed it, you can guess it pretty easy. Every week is going to talk about one of these relationships. Well, the first week is we're going to talk about how do you have a better relationship with God, and then week two is how do you have a better relationship with yourself, because I believe at the core, if you can spend the next four weeks working on better habits and better relationships with the things around you, bigger will come. The bigger call will come. The bigger breakthrough and that addiction and that struggle that you have, it will come. The bigger influence that you want, that will come. Why? Because better comes before bigger every single time. And when we flip the script back to the way that God intended, all of a sudden God does something incredible in and through us. And so as you leave today, you're going to be giving us, it's our gift to you because we care about you and we want to help you get better. At the end of the day, this has not come from me though. At the end of the day, this, this concept came from a story I heard probably 12 years ago. Um, it's a story of Truett Cathy, who is the founder of Chick-fil-A. How many of you know what Chick-fil-A is? Amen. Yes. Jesus chicken. Yeah. <laughs> That's not true at all. Anyway, so... No, I love it. And, and there's a story that I love so much. Matter of fact, the reason I love the company is because I studied the story and I, and I, and I love what they're built on. Because see, in the 90s, you probably don't know this, there was this other restaurant that we've long forgotten called Boston Market. And Boston Market used to be the big up and coming thing. It was like, oh man, they had, they had what I would call Satan chicken, okay? Like it was just not really. But anyway, so, um, but they were just growing, growing, growing. And Chick-fil-A is freaking out because they're in their space. There's only so many people and, and there's a scarcity mindset and they're like, man, we gotta get bigger, we gotta get bigger, we gotta get bigger, we gotta get bigger. We gotta keep up. And, and Boston Market had a vision that said by the year 2000, we wanna have a gross sales of over a billion dollars and Chick-fil-A is going, how do we keep up? So the story is that they get all the VPs together, all the smart execs, the financial people together and they're talking about how do we, how do we expand and where the markets we need to go to and how do we borrow more money and how do we do all this. And, and about 45 minutes into it, the, the CEO, Truett Cathy, is quiet. And then it says he just starts to pound the table over and over again until everybody shuts up. And then he said something that changed the culture and the course of the whole organization said this. Gentlemen, I am sick and tired of hearing you talk about us getting bigger. What we need to be talking about is how to get better. And I love this. If we get better, our customers will demand that we get bigger. And that is so true. 
Matter of fact, somebody told me that we're getting a Chick-fil-A next year in Glasgow. I was like, praise Jesus, prayer works. I will be the first one there. And what we've seen is that, is it happened. In fact, here's the craziest thing. By 2000, Boston Market was out of business. And in that year, Chick-fil-A grossed, can you guess it? Over $1 billion. Why? Because they understood a principle. Better. Better always comes before bigger. So I don't know what your bigger is. I don't know what it is. What I'm telling you is it's on the other side of you getting serious with God, yourself, others, and your stuff, and getting better, it, developing the right habits, developing the right identity, developing the right boundaries and relationships with that kind of stuff. When you do that, God has an abundant life for you that he wants to give you. And my prayer is, my hope is, that you would step into it in this next season. With that said, few moments we're going to do baptisms and for some of you you have been saved you've given your life to Christ but you've not been faithful with the commands that God's called you to you're praying for some stuff that's bigger and today you need to take a step to be faithful to be better with what God's called you and today I want to invite you if you've never been baptized but you are saved I want to invite you would you just would you just make that commitment we're going we're gonna to open that door back there in a few moments, and Chris is going to lead us in a song, and we're going we're gonna to line people up, and we're going we're gonna to baptize them. I don't know how many we've got this service. Um, what I know is that there are some people in here. You showed up today maybe, and, and you didn't plan on getting baptized, but the Holy Spirit's convicting you. It's like, no, this is your day. And you're going to come up with a whole bunch of excuses and reason why not to. I love what happened last night. I said the same thing last night, and we had a gentleman who, who showed up and did not plan on getting baptized, had no clothes, was not ready, just had all the excuses, had a dislocated shoulder. And so we're back there, and we're like, okay, we got this guy. And, and, and Pastor Kevin looks at me, and he goes, I got to be careful baptizing. And I'm like, why? And he goes, well, because he just told me that if I pull him up too hard, I might dislocate his shoulder again, but it'll be okay. It'll pop back in. So I don't know what your excuse is. <laughs> His was better, but he chose to be faithful in that moment. And so whether you need to give your life to Christ, we'd love to talk to you about that. Whether you need to get baptized, I don't know what it is. I want to invite, would you all stand with me? I want to pray. I'm going to pray for boldness. I'm going to pray that this next season, this almost Christmas season, it's going to be the best one that you've ever had. But it's going to come about because you were faithful. You decided to be better. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the goodness, the generous God that you are. Help us see all the gifts that we've been given. Not just the financial, but the relational, the spiritual, the emotional, the mental gifts. God, you have been so, so good to us. I pray for the next few moments for those that plan to get baptized and for those in here right now, God, that you're working on their heart. They can feel it. They're arguing. God, I pray that they would not argue but submit to your will. They would trust. They would trust that this world has nothing to offer compared to what you have. God, I pray that you would make the next few moments incredibly special and unique. God, we love you. We thank you so much. Amen.